Hello and welcome to The Road to Autonomy. The Road to Autonomy is brought to you in part by Stantec Generation AV. Stantec Generation AV combines some of the most experienced AV experts in the industry with the resources of a global engineering firm. Stantec Generation AV provides education, consulting, assessment, and guidance to any industry interested in autonomous vehicles. Learn more at Stantec.com. Hello and welcome to The Road to Autonomy. I'm your host, Grayson Brulte. On today's episode, we're absolutely honored to have Greg Rodriguez, Mobility Policy Principal, Stantec. Greg, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Grayson. Thanks so much for having me. Really excited to be here. Really excited to have you here, and, and thank you to Stantec for being the sponsor of The Road to Autonomy. That's super awesome. But more importantly, Greg, you're one of the sharpest minds I know in policy as it relates to mobility, so I can't wait to dive into this conversation today. Thanks, Grayson. That's very kind of you, and I will not take credit as being the sharpest, but I really enjoy the conversation that's being had, and this is the perfect time to be talking about mobility innovation in the future, and I appreciate you know all the great guests you've been bringing on the podcast, and honored to be one of those now. Oh, thanks. Well, okay, I'll say it this way. You play a vital vital role in, in everything that's happening in, in policy in D.C. as it relates to mobility. And my favorite thing is autonomy. I love autonomy. You're a policy guy. So, Greg, what is the current state of autonomous vehicle policy from the federal level? It's a good question, Grayson, and I think it, it changes yearly, if not daily. And I think one word to describe it all right now would be lacking. We've all been waiting four or five years now with anticipation on this federal framework coming out and for us seeing more automated vehicles being deployed and eventually getting to that road towards autonomous as well. And I think there's a real appetite for federal leadership right now, in my opinion. But unfortunately, for whatever reasons, and I think we'll get into some of them today, we haven't seen the right formula to navigate all the interests and new legal and regulatory issues that AVs bring. So I think, you know, again, in one word, lacking. There's been this let's call it excitement. Okay, we're close, we're close, we're close. We came out of energy and commerce. Then it's like, oh, it's dead. And then it's like, there's been this really interesting start stop. It's like the kids game, red light, green light. You go, you go, you don't go. Is that with the concerns around the legal liability or what are the general concerns that's causing the red light, green light game? I think it's a really good point. I'm looking forward to teaching red light, green light to my toddler right now. It's all green light. And I think it's it's kind of the, the challenge right now around technology. And to me, it comes down to the word trust. So I think, you know, we have a hearing. Everybody gets excited again. You see Twitter and LinkedIn blow up around automated vehicles or autonomous vehicles. But then everything dies out because there isn't the coordination or leadership to kind of follow up on the interesting conversations being had, whether it be how do we pay for lane striping or How do we navigate the safety issue while standards are being developed? Or even as I think we're going to discuss a little later, you know, should autonomous vehicles be shared or passenger owned? So it seems like there's excitement. Everybody loves technology. But the moment you have to answer or delve in some of these hard questions, everybody kind of takes a breaks and and goes in their own silos or splits up into their own ways. And so there's kind of this lack of coordination, which, you know, in my opinion, is an important role of federal government, and it's just been lacking. You brought up the single most important issue with all forms of autonomy, trust. Without trust, the technology won't work. Without trust, the passengers will not go in there. Without trust, shippers will not put their valuable freight on autonomous trucks. Trust is the fundamental key to scaling autonomy. How can trust be built between the industry and government? Oh, that's like the billion dollar question, right? <laughs> right, Grayson? Before coming to Stantec, I was a practicing attorney and delving a lot in the space of exactly the question that you're talking about. How can we get more coordination between the public and private sector as we think about some of these new emerging technologies? And to me, one of the biggest things that's lacking right now is is a clear understanding between the public and private sector around how to get to this long-term vision of mobility. I think if we could get past these short-term and medium-term speed bumps that we're seeing, I think everybody aligns on the long-term vision of enhanced mobility, of increased access to options, more efficiency, even if that means the private sector making money off of it. But again, when you think about if you're a public agency, whether a DOT or a city, 
you have these very complicated governance structures, whether it be public contracting, whether it be regulations tied to federal funding. Those same requirements don't exist in the private sector when you have an uh, AV company very focused on deployment. And so, you know, I think it's just trying to align expectations and trying to align, you know, existing resources a little better, I think is, is one of the reasons we haven't seen it. And the example I always like to use is if you're a city and you're a small town mayor, there's two things you're really worried about. If you, especially if you're in the Midwest, you get a snowstorm. First thing you're going to do is make sure those roads are plowed. And then the second big issue is make sure that trash gets picked up, right? And the last thing on a small town mayor's mind is going to be making sure an automated vehicle gets deployed versus an AV company when all their resources are dedicated towards just one thing versus a mayor, especially a small town mayor, probably wearing 10 different hats, right? So kind of level setting the conversation, I think, would be one opportunity. And let's not forget the small town mayors. Another big issue they care about is traffic and parking. Absolutely. That's a big one. We, we look at issues, we, we see the horrible incidents that are, that are happening around the world today, and there's a lot of geopolitical issues from no matter what side you're, of the spectrum you're on. And then you look at certain individuals inside of Congress say, we want America to lead on all things autonomy, which, which I fully agree with. And then you look ar- around the world, and America's falling behind on autonomy and leading from a policy perspective, not a development perspective necessarily, but from a policy perspective. And during the Chinese National People's Congress, the chairman of SAIC, the largest automaker in China, recently put forward a proposal to clarify the legal status of autonomous driving systems with the aim of speeding up the commercialization of smart vehicles. Does energy and commerce or some other inside of Congress react and say, wait a second, China's going to, no pun intended, drive ahead of us on autonomy, we need to speed up a national framework because now it's a potential becoming a national security issue. Yeah, I would love to say yes, Grayson. We're, they're going to jump on it. But I think, you know, you pointed out some very difficult realities, both what the world is facing right now and the ongoing tragedies and, and war we're seeing in, in Ukraine. I think those geopolitical challenges and the current political environment in Congress and with midterms coming up, you know, I think those are just going to really impede our ability to really focus on AVs. But on the other hand, just because there isn't anything happening at the federal government level doesn't mean that states and local governments can't continue to move forward. I very much understand we don't want a patchwork of regulations, but in my approach to, to our current work, I don't think we need to be passing regulations. We need to figure out how to get more testing and deployment. And yes, the federal government provides this opportunity from a funding perspective, but if we can coordinate more around the use cases and opportunities and have more testing in different operational domains across the country, you know, not just the Southwest, but also the Northeast, I think we can advance the conversation enough where we don't have to idle and and wait and see, and maybe inspire the federal government to act from more of a a ground-up perspective. The Northeast is interesting if you run it in the Northeast and New England, for example, and the summer is beautiful. The weather conditions outside of the the monsoon rainstorms that roll in every afternoon, seemingly, it's a beautiful place to test. If you give an example, if you run it on Nantucket Island or you run on Martha's Vineyard, that's an interesting ODD where you have a captive audience for, say, three months of the year to run. But I look a lot towards deployments around the I-10. We're going to run from, from Arizona to Florida. That becomes interesting that if a politician on a federal list, wait a second, the trucking, autonomous trucking companies running from Arizona to Florida were able to reduce the cost of shipping by X and um, getting all these different issues. And I rep- I'm a congressman in one of these states. That becomes interesting from a political perspective. Is that trying, hey, I didn't really believe this technology, but... My constituents are calling me up and saying, thank you for lowering the cost of a good. That becomes interesting from a policy standpoint. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think you, you know, tee up something that I, I definitely want the listeners to be thinking about. You know, I think we often lump automated or autonomous solutions into passenger vehicles when we're talking about these things in, in normal conversation at conferences or even the hearings. You very rarely hear us going down the opportunities around freight and goods movement, and even breaking it down from commercial trucking 
down to local goods movement, where I think that's where we're going to see a lot of really interesting strides, but also new tensions on existing roles and responsibilities or, or existing federal preemption. When you think about the interstate commerce clause and some of the existing jurisdiction that the federal government has and, and has exercised around the movement of goods. But if you're dealing with only these examples of neuro operating intrastate, should we still be within the regulations of interstate commerce? Or is this new regulatory structure that perhaps allows more coordination and partnership between local governments to come to fruition? But kind of a, going down a, a different tangent, but I, I completely agree with you. I think even looking at the I-95, right? I, I live in Washington, D.C., went to my first concert in a very long time up in Baltimore, you know, last week. And we're driving up at 7 p.m. The amount of trucks on the I-95 corridor was amazing to see. Some of those are going to the port of Baltimore. Others are going perhaps all the way up to the Canadian border. And so I think Yes, it's great to have those Southern routes, but also to think about these other opportunities from a goods movement perspective will be interesting. And to be candid, to also be testing in more difficult operational environments that are all weather. All weather is going to be the key to scaling. The other key, you know, for I-95, well, I think it must be the busiest corridor in the United States, if not one of the busiest corridors in the United States, especially when you get up to New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut, is autonomous trucks will be safer. There's reports of uh, you know, certain drivers driving over the hours and, and driving under methamphetamine or other issues. The autonomous truck is not going to do that. The autonomous truck, has one focus is to get there safely. That becomes really, really interesting when the roads become safer because it's unfortunate. Every once in a while, you open a newspaper or you turn on the TV and you see an incident of an evolving something that could have been prevented if the individual behind the wheel was driving and autonomous trucks will not have those issues because they're, they're always going to pay attention. And that saves lives. And that's a good thing. Yeah, I think you're, you're right, Grayson. And, and just, you know, again, we at Stantec, when you think about us thinking about the entire ecosystem, you know, it's not just the operation of the technology, but the existing infrastructure. And from a logistical perspective, when you have different traffic patterns moving on roads. And to your point, thinking about the opportunity for an automated platoon. Yes, we have to be mindful of how many trucks are platooning. I don't think that gets talked about very often because I think the last thing I want to see is 10 large trucks barreling down a highway. I am not a physicist, but that seems like that's going to take a long time for that to stop, you know, from a safety perspective. But to see these vehicles potentially operating from 1 to 6 a.m., as a lot of people talk about, not only is there potential safety benefits, but also you know, minimizing traffic and really thinking about how do we prioritize the use of roads based on demands. And, and granted, those demands have changed a lot because of COVID, but thinking about that and then using data analytics to plan out when roads could potentially be used or hours of operation, I think that is the discussion we should be having as well as we're talking about the deployment of these technologies. And that raises the point that certain individuals are kicking around with the vehicle mile travel tax. And then I was having a conversation with an individual today who was talking about toll lanes for autonomous trucks. If they use the port of Baltimore, for example, does the private sector build a dedicated road from the port of Baltimore to an inland intermodal where it goes either to the local Walmart or if it goes to the rail? And then they charge the, the autonomous company a per mile tax, essentially, if you want to call it per mile fee, if you want to use that word as well. That becomes interesting. Imagine the amount of freight that you can move on that corridor, what it would do to the, to the supply chain for the United States. Because I believe that the key of this is when we can connect shipping from freight from a mar maritime onto an autonomous truck onto rail, the United States has the world's best supply chain infrastructure. To get there, we need big, bold leadership. How do we get there? Because when you look at commercial autonomous trucking, infrastructure is going to play a large, large role in that future. Yeah, I think that's a, a great question. And it dovetails nicely with you know the State of the Union address that we just heard, where we heard that we're in infrastructure decade. Okay, that's a great talking point. But the bill we just passed is only five years. And we still don't have a long-term solution to pay for infrastructure. So even if we're talking within a context like your question from a, a VMT perspective, that is a new way to be thinking about funding the infrastructure for the future. I think from a policy perspective, 
the conversation will need to be whether or not we use existing infrastructure and dedicate a lane for that, or do we build a new toll road that's just for commercial vehicles? The challenge with that conversation is going to change state by state and jurisdiction by jurisdiction. I'm from California. You think about some of the environmental reviews that need to be done around any transportation project. You know, it may not be as easy to pass a toll road in a place like California versus here, like you said, the I-95 corridor or someplace that connects a, a port to a commercial center. You know, maybe there's more appetite for that. Or do we start to see some federal exemptions that start to come into play from a NEPA environmental review perspective? Again, in my mind, it, it's thinking about the impacts that currently exist in the way we do things and how can we minimize those impacts? And I think you're right. It's thinking about how can we create more efficiencies to move goods and you know whether or not you agree that infrastructure should be prioritized for the movement of goods, efficiency does lead to more sustainable benefits, right? I don't think anybody's going to argue with that. Like some of the things we're seeing with the port of LA and, and truck idling, you know, emissions are going up, right? And so it's thinking about how can we create more efficiencies to re- reduce bottlenecks so that we use the transportation system better. And so, yeah, we have to get in some difficult policy conversations but at least addressing the issue right now, I think, is important and trying to think more long term as opposed to being reactionary. I like to use the term think big, do big. And it's going to take a lot of political leadership. It's going to take a lot of gamesmanship to get there because we have to do something. The average price of diesel, according to AAA data, is over over $4 a gallon. Based on the geopolitical issues, which we alluded to earlier, and Brent crew trading over $130 a barrel, you look at solutions to help lower the cost of goods for for individuals. Autonomous trucking, it's been widely reported from multiple companies, multiple audits, they can reduce the fuel consumption by 20%. That's a huge positive benefit for reducing the cost of goods. It's also a huge positive for the environment because you're taking carbon out of the air, which raises the policy question. We have the midterms coming up in November. We have a highly polarized country Can anything, think big, do big, happen during the next three years? Oh, that's a a really big question, Grayson. I wish I had a crystal ball. But, well, let me take a step back really quick before we get into the political question. I think your point around impacts and and reducing emissions and leading to efficiency, I think that does bring in an opportunity with automation. On the other hand, I think we need to be mindful of those that are skeptical saying, Will that just increase consumer demand and lead to more VMT or more vehicles on roads causing more traffic, right? I think we still need to figure that out. And that's where I think focusing the conversation around impacts and then management of the system from a systems operations perspective, I think is the opportunity rather, again, than getting into the, I don't like using the heaven versus hell scenario. I like trying to say, okay, how do we find this middle ground that's solution oriented? And maybe that leads us into your other conversation about, yeah, how do we get more long-term thinking around this? I think you and I have talked about this offline, but in my mind, it's how to refocus the conversation around everything that we were excited around five or six years ago with, you know, some of the things being done under the Obama administration, some of the things around how do we advance automation, things like ladders of opportunity, really thinking about enhancing mobility and incorporating and integrating technology in the right way. I don't hear a lot of that discussion right now because we are so granularly focused on whether or not AVs are safe or not, or whether or not they're going to cause traffic or not, as opposed to maybe taking a step back and really saying, okay, now that we see these more tangible use cases, how can we align the gaps in our transportation system with the potential deployment of these technologies? And I have to think we can kind of excite people again around the opportunities, as opposed to right now, I feel like we're really focused on the impediments or barriers. That's a valid point. The other thing that's, there's, I'm going to give a shout out to my mutual friend, Greg Rogers and the the team over at Neuro. What Neuro's doing in Houston by engaging that local community and showing them what the Neuro bots are, what the positive impact they could have on their community, where a mom, single mom might not have access to a car, but the neuro can bring her family fresh fruits and vegetables. That's a really positive thing. And more, more companies have to take that positive engagement. So 
Team Neuro, great, great job for building that community engagement. That was hot years ago, and then it kind of just faded away, like we're going from high tide to low tide, just went out. Why do you think that was? That's a really good question. I'm not in the business of doing financial analytics, but I think it gets to kind of what is the potential return on investment around us deploying automated vehicles, if if we take the neuro example, right? I think right now, again, we're so focused on some of the tangible financial things, for lack of better words, that we're not thinking about the broader societal conversations. Like Greg and team have done a really good job of focusing on food deserts and really promoting the importance that policy has or policy opportunities around access to healthy foods. And I think, it, again, it, it's, it's because the return on investment isn't as clear. And I think it also goes back to the very siloed way that we're used to doing transportation. And it, that's one of the big things I think we need to, if we want to see these, if we want to see our transportation system evolve, then we need to evolve in the way that we approach transportation planning. And it, it's starting to think how the future mobility transcends existing mobility jurisdictions. And so we're, you brought up parking. That is the traditional thing around transportation. But now how can we thinking about access to grocery stores or the now the convergence with electric vehicle charging infrastructure where, you know, there's a reason we now have a joint office that's being stood up between DOE and DOT because energy and transportation are merging. And so if we can figure out a way, I think, to refocus on community engagement around these potential positive social benefits that come with technology, I think that's a way to, again, get people excited again around around the opportunities around innovation, where it doesn't just look like a revenue generator. Instead, it it looks like a a game changer from just a better society perspective. And to think big, you're going to need bold leadership. In a March 7th, 2022 interview with, with Bloomberg, the CTO of MTA came out and said, I hate to break it to you. I'm going to be honest. Subway ridership's never going back to peak of where it is. We have to look at other solutions. That's probably the largest public transportation agency in the United States. That was a big statement. Friends in public transportation didn't like to hear what the gentleman said. But to the gentleman, thank you for saying the truth. How do you see that? You have the C- CEO of MTA coming out and saying it's never going back. We have to look at other alternatives. Does that open up the door to micro transit where if there's a certain route, say if you're going to go north to Harlem, where there might be four or five people on the bus, do you put them in a smaller vehicle versus a larger bus, both from an economic standpoint and from a carbon impact standpoint? Do we start to see new innovative technologies roll into public transportation because of that bold statement that MTA made? I, I think that's right, Grayson. I mean, I think the conversation around public transportation, similar to our conversation around autonomous vehicles, is very much determined by geography and existing infrastructure. So again, you know, I'm I'm lucky to live in a place like DC where there had been an investment in public transportation and I have access to a lot of different public transportation options when I walk out my door. I'm very lucky. As we think about places like my hometown in San Diego, which was built out and now is trying to reinvest in public transportation, I think there is going to be this conversation around what is going to be the best use of limited and now more competitively accessed transportation dollars for transit. What is the best way to think about how to address system needs and consumer needs? One thing we've been thinking a lot about is how do fleets need to transition, right? Even the current size of buses, is that really the right size or do we need to think about smaller, like you said, micro transit fleets that are also on demand that, yes, they may be geography specific, but not route specific. Again, just to make sure that we're adapting to the system to user needs, user demand, and the more point to point contact that I think people expect when they're booking transit. And it, it's one of the reasons why people still drive their own vehicle, right? It's that convenience for door-to-door service. So I think I think we're going to continue to see conversations around the future of transit, how it's funded, and how can it evolve to you know meet changing demands. But I want to emphasize, I still think public transportation plays a very important part 
of our transportation system, but there's likely an evolution needed and to think more about roles and responsibilities and the opportunities that come with private sector partnerships. The future of mobility, in my opinion, will be defined by convenience. Convenience has a lot of really positive upsides outside of the economics. One, it can allow an individual to go to a, a better school, perhaps a night school, or going to get their their MBA after hours in an area where public transportation doesn't serve it. It can allow a, an individual who wants to get a job in an area where public transportation doesn't serve it. So it creates a lot of really good societal value there. And in a December 17, 2021 letter that you sent to the U.S. Department of Transportation on behalf of Stantec in response to the strategic plan request for comments, you stated the following, shared. Shared mobility must be incentivized, starting with public transit, where possible, while also fostering partnerships, on-demand responsive solutions. Is that kind of in a nutshell what you just described earlier? Yeah, I think that's right, you know, Grayson, and I appreciate you, you know, pointing out our letter. It's great to see Stantec's willingness to respond to that request for comments and, and really trying to think about how can we help, you know, UST think about what's needed from a strategic standpoint. And our whole focus is whenever possible, how can we help provide on the ground experience that we're seeing from our clients. And I think the shared mobility must be incentivized comment. You use the word convenience. I think that's right, but we need to make sure that convenient options exist across the city, right? Not just within a certain part of the city where there may be wealthier individuals, whether or not you call that market access or not, where, you know, services might be pushed towards. And I think that's what we get to with the incentivizing conversation is, is to really make sure that nobody's left behind. I'm a big believer that the more mobility options that we can provide people access to, the more likelihood people will realize, oh, wow, I don't need to own my car anymore. But they do need to be convenient. They need to be reliable. They need to be safe and they need to be accessible. And I think, you know, us thinking about the incentivizing conversation is to make sure that we're making sure that we have equity in the deployments and that we're also thinking about how to make sure some of these shared mobility solutions that have arguably gone away, whether it be Lyft Line, Uber Pool, how do we make sure that they continue to be a part of the broader conversation within our transportation system? And how could they be potential partnerships for transit? Like, how do we make sure that we continue to invest in those? to see where they're viable. I know that you follow the market and and some of the work that VIA is doing. I think we need to give out a shout out to them for continuing to promote, you know, a shared mobility micro transit partner option for transit. You know, the one of the few companies that's kind of stayed in that lane and been able to continue, I think, to increase their valuation, right? But even to that point, VIA was valued, what, at $2 billion, maybe $3 billion, right? And I would ask the question, When's the last time somebody did a valuation of a public transportation system and what it means to a city from a service perspective? Yeah, there's decreasing, you know, fare box recovery, right? Very few transit systems meet 100% 100 fare box recovery, but I also don't think any Lyft or Uber ride gets 100% revenue across the board or across the country, right? So I think it's this level setting conversation, which kind of we were talking about earlier. And and it's this opportunity to, to really understand what, does the future transportation system look like? And where are these new opportunities for new partnerships between the public and private sector? Going back to one of your previous questions as well. VIA is confidentially filed for an IPO according to data in the Bloomberg terminal. So we'll see when that becomes public, what the valuation is. We'll we'll see. And due to market conditions, who knows that they even go forward, but they have confidentially filed there. To me, the number one key partnership that is needed is local community. You have to engage the local churches, the local community leaders, the boys and girls clubs, the after school clubs to expose children and the parents these in new emerging mobility technologies. They might have never been exposed and they might have never experienced it. How great would that be if a, if a company went there and partnered with these local community leaders to introduce this, these new forms of mobility? could change a child's life. Child could end up going to a better, you know, for a charter school, for example. All these things could happen because somebody took the time to care. Yeah, I think that's right. Not that we're trying to say that charter schools are better than public schools, Grayson, because we want to give choice and options. But your point is well taken around trying to make sure that 
not only is it choice related to mobility options, but choice for access to a school that you want to go to, right? It's great that more cities have opened up lottery systems. It's great to see charter schools coming online. And if you want your child to go so to a certain school, to your point, you shouldn't be impeded by the lack of transportation options. And I think you hit on a key point that, again, I don't think is talked about enough as a, a use case, but it is replacing school busing, right? A lot of cities or school districts, that's the first thing that goes is busing because it's very expensive. And so is there's this opportunity with some of these new innovations, not that we have to go completely to autonomous, but even more on demand. I know VIA is working on a couple of pilot projects in New York that they've put out some press releases on. The, the, again, this, this untapped opportunity to increase social benefits that's connected to mobility and showing the new connections that enhanced mobility can create. Again, that's what the Obama administration is really focused on. And we were talking about when we were talking about emerging technologies and and we're not right now for whatever reason. On-demand school buses based on routes and distances and traffic patterns is interested. I don't know the average age of kid gets a phone now, but it seems every day it gets younger and younger where the child could pull their buddy. Hey, Bobby. Hey, Jane. Okay, let's take the school bus. Okay, let's get there early. We've got extracurriculars. We're working on a project today. That's interesting. And it also builds the one number one thing we need in the society, community. We get them to interact with a human face to face. So perhaps, you know, something good comes of the current situation and these technologies get evolved. But on the backside, what happens if consumers fundamentally reject shared services and they don't want it? Yeah, I think that's a fair question. And I think, you know, it goes to our conversation around options and consumer choice. I think consumers should have the right to choose which mobility option they want to use. But I think we need to do a better job of tying transportation decisions to impacts. I'm going to keep going back to that word. I do think we need to have a better conversation around the value of of transportation, right? One of the things that I've been thinking about, and I don't have the economics of this, but you know, I've been thinking about it since Uber and Lyft came online, is you know, the, have have that created a false sense of value of a trip and what it takes to ensure a safe trip, right? So the other day I was stopped at an intersection and I was looking around and being like, okay, there's so much that goes into the cost of the safe operation of my vehicle right now. I was looking at the traffic signal signals. I was looking at the lane striping. I even heard the chirping that comes from a crosswalk now, you know, to make sure that a, a blind pedestrian knows that it's safe to walk, right? That all takes a lot of money And then as we're thinking about, again, this long-term conversation around how to pay for all this, is me taking an Uber trip truly capturing the value of my trip? Because I, in my opinion, I'm no longer paying the gas tax. My Uber or Lyft driver is, right? And even as an owner of an electric vehicle, I'm no longer paying the gas tax. So I guess it's, it's this conversation more around impacts and trying to then move the impacts to a better way of pricing a trip, right? And I don't wanna get into a conversation around the politics around congestion pricing and things like that, but I do think we need to start thinking about, again, the impacts of our transportation systems and making sure that if you choose to drive alone, then the cost of driving alone is captured some way with your trip versus taking a transit trip that might be moving 50 people at once in my mind, there's less impacts there, right? And I don't have all the answers, but I think there's, I think that's just a, a conversation that needs to be had. And it gets to our BMT conversation as well, right? That's a political hot potato I'll, I'll stay away from. But the gas <laughs> the, the gas tax is, a, is an interesting one. Obviously, as we go over, say, 20, 30, 40% of all vehicles in America are electric. How do you replace the gas tax? And at what percentage of, of EV ownership should something be done because if you do it too early you're going to stunt the growth of evs and they're going to go by the wayside and then you got this little thing called hybrid that's going to take over because they're still chugging along what is that tipping point do you think for evs you know that's a good question grayson i I wish i was more of a energy expert and i know there's a lot of really good analysis that's being done kind of maybe taking a step back and thinking more about the infrastructure bill that was just passed we're about to see this huge investment in EV infrastructure, which I think is good, but being mindful of making sure that funding is going to where it's needed. And I I just, 
I really want to make sure that, yeah, we continue to push the adoption of EVs, but from a diversification perspective, is the conversation more around zero emission vehicles, right? And I think, again, you and I have talked about, you know, how realistic is it to expect that every single automated vehicle is also electric? I think we've heard that a lot, but is is that really possible when we start thinking about the use cases from heavy duty to you know, buses to then light duty. And I think it goes to your point, and I'd love to get your thought on this. I think you have some thoughts, but it goes to the opportunity around education, right? How do we make sure that we're educating consumers around the real potential of the technology, its capabilities, and then the impacts of combustion engine versus electric vehicles, and then making sure that lawmakers and policymakers understand the emerging technologies as well. And I do think your idea around, you know, more community engagement can potentially accomplish both. It can open and provide these experience opportunities for people to experience these new technologies. And if that creates demand, then lawmakers will listen, right? And policymakers will listen. But I'm curious if you have any thoughts on kind of the the level setting, the EV, AB conversation a little bit. We have to decouple EV from AV, not every autonomous vehicle will be electric. I'll repeat again, not every autonomous vehicle will be electric. There's a variety of reasons why. Will the Zooks, the, the, the cruises, the neurons of the world? Yes. That makes economic sense for them in the way that they're running in dense urban environments with access to charging. It makes a lot of sense, but I spend a lot of my time focused on autonomous trucking and, and, and the global trade and infrastructure that goes along with it. And currently, there is not enough EV heavy duty, I repeat, EV heavy duty charging currently available in the United States. There are no corridors, even though BlackRock and Xterra Energy, along with Daimler Truck North America, have teamed up for a $900 million fund. There's not access to that. And then also, there's talk about hydrogen, but hydrogen is not as clean as everybody says, unless we get green hydrogen, which is there. But then again, we don't have the charging infrastructure, or if you want to use the word fueling infrastructure for green hydrogen. And then when on the other side, we do not have the powertrains. So we're obviously going towards a low carbon world. And I think a lot about this with the fuel efficiency, as I said earlier, of 20% reduction with autonomous trucking. What if autonomous trucks took a Cummins engine that was manufacturing using renewable energy and parts of the truck cab were built using recycled parts? That's a really positive step forward. And it's something that's practical today because until the fueling situation is is chosen. We're never going to achieve it. And then I think a lot about this, and I'm going to sound like a War- an old school Warner Brothers cartoon. If somebody decides to misbehave and put their finger into a heavy duty electric vehicle charging pole, how do they not go kablooey? <laughs> we have to get over that too. You're like a wily coyote and a roadrunner, right? There you go. Yeah. Totally. You probably won't get a second life if you do that. <laughs> and I think you know. Yeah, I think your question's a good one. And and kind of where our lane is right now is trying to stay neutral around all this and really thinking about what is, you know, the connection between the built environment, infrastructure needs, and the integration of emerging technologies, whether it be electric vehicles or also, you know, autonomous vehicles. And I think, you know, some interesting things for us to be thinking about is a lot of our urbanist friends say we shouldn't have any more parking garages, right? And I just kind of take a step back and think about the logistics. Well, if we have a potential fleet of Waymo or cruise vehicles operating and they're electric, I would like to think we would want to, you know, make sure we still have space for them to charge as they're hopefully running their subscription fleet operations within an urban environment, right? To reduce VMT. So that's like a just an interesting policy conversation that I think can generate a lot of heated conversation, but again, just something we need to be thinking about as we think about the built environment and the future mobility, prioritization of right-of-way, right? I I know congestion pricing, very hot potato, but as we start to see more options come onto the right-of-way in our streets, you know, not only from a safety perspective, from an efficiency perspective, I think we need to be thinking about how do we want to prioritize the use of our right-of-way and And still taking into account, you know, pedestrians and active transportation. And to me, it's it's really thinking about what are the new opportunities to rethink roles and responsibilities, right? And I think, you know, going back to kind of the theme of this conversation, why haven't we seen more action around autonomous vehicles? 
you know, there are these new tension points when you start to think about shifting roles and responsibilities for level four, level five autonomous vehicles. How does that change existing antiquated governance structures on the federal, state, and local side? And I think a lot of local governments want to understand how can they be more involved in the planning process. You know, I don't think they want to impede the process. I think they just want to be coordinated with. And, I, you know, I, I think that's just a challenge we need to get around as well. So I think everything that we kind of talked about at New News Opera, you kind of piece all that together for a new plan forward. The planning process is key. And shout out to Stantec, the, the Gen AV division helps cities, municipalities, private sector plan for those AVs. So shout out to the Stantec Gen AV team there. Because you, you look at things and for the foreseeable future, we're going to have human driven vehicles. You got Alex Roy's Human Driving Association, rah, 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 rah. I'm going to drive, I'm going to race. And then we're going to, and then he's at Argo and he's working on autonomous vehicles. It's a, it's a great oxymoron, Alex. I love you. But for the foreseeable future, we're going to have both human and autonomous vehicles. From a policy perspective, what challenges and opportunities does that provide? So I think, again, it's where the terminology is so important, Grayson, right? I don't expect to be able to buy an autonomous level four, level five vehicle anytime soon in the future. Arguably, we're at level two. Maybe we get to level three, but that personally owned vehicle level four, level five is probably a ways away. And so, again, going back to this consumer education, also lawmaker education opportunity, I think that needs needs to be talked about a little bit more. And I think then it goes back to that conversation around prioritization of the right of way, right? And thinking about it from a local government perspective, since, you know, I, I used to, I, I was, I worked at Sandag and, and used to represent cities. There is this interesting conversation around how does the regulation of safety potentially move into the built environment, you know, outside of the vehicle. And I'm just very curious, again, I don't, you know, thinking about, can we say that a corridor is not AV safe and then have AVs banned from a corridor? Is that in a future world, is that going to be a city right or is that fall under NHTSA's preemption, right? I, I don't think there's an answer to that having done some research around it. You also think about, you know, weight limitations on roads right now for commercial vehicles, right? The, the cities have that right to say there's no trucks here. Could Again, does that apply to AVs? And I guess a, a long way, the kind of the point that I'm trying to get to is how can we avoid that point, right? How can we avoid the conversation versus you can't take my right to drive away? That shouldn't be the conversation point or cities even thinking about banning AVs. It should be aligning the technology and its capabilities and use cases with a community's needs. And I think that's the opportunity for coordination to your point, to make sure that we're providing more options to people and then, you know, to let them make their decisions. But the tension point is going to be, how do you better align a transportation decision with the impact it may be having on the use of infrastructure. So a very complicated question, but I think, again, it's this opportunity to refocus the conversation on the options and potential for the technology, as opposed to be predicting, as opposed to predicting how the technology is going to be adopted when the technology is not even available yet. I think that's an important point. The bottom line is, the industry has to level set with consumers and properly set expectations. And boy, oh boy, have we've gotten a lot better over the last couple of years of, of level setting. Yes, there are outliners that are not properly level setting, but we have to level set with the consumer, explain the terminology, explain that, no, you cannot go buy a self-driving car today. You can ride around San Francisco in the cruise vehicle. You can ride around Chandler, Arizona in the Waymo One vehicle. You can soon ride around Miami in the Argo AI vehicle, but you cannot go to your local dealership and order a self-driving car. I repeat, there today, a consumer cannot buy a self-driving car. We have to we have to get there. We have to set the terminology straight. And I love to know we've gone all over the map. We went to policy world. We went to this world. We went to infrastructure world. Next thing you know, you're going to ask me to go to Jurassic Park world, but I don't think we're there yet because amusement parks are a really great place to deploy autonomous vehicles as long as uh, the dinosaurs stay in their little area and don't decide to go out like a Jeff Goldblum moment. 
in your opinion, what does the future of mobility look like? So I think taking all that together and your very good Jurassic Park analogy, I think it's complicated, but filled with opportunity. I really want to stress that. Like I, there's a reason I'm in this space, despite banging my head against the ground a lot with you know, some of the short-sightedness. I think if we can, again, refocus a conversation on the long term, can really get back to that excitement around opportunity. I think we need to, if we're going to realize the future of mobility, then we need to stop trying to fit emerging technologies into antiquated governance structures. And I think more coordination between the public and private sector. I think we talked about it today. And I think the idea around focusing it on the consumer piece and these use cases that can in- enhance mobility within communities would be a great way to start. It's a great way to start because autonomy has a lot of really great opportunities. Autonomy will allow a child to go to a better school. Autonomy will shore up the supply chain. Autonomy will possibly prevent a death when you're having a heart attack in a vehicle because it can reroute that vehicle if you pass out to a hospital. There's all these wonderful things that autonomy is going to do. The bottom line is autonomy will have a positive impact on society, and we will get there. You might bang your head today, but tomorrow we'll have a beer and we'll high-five each other and say, okay, you know what? It was worth this hard work. We did really good. And Greg, as we look to wrap up this insightful conversation, what would you like our listeners to take away with them? Transportation is is expensive. Right now, we we have this opportunity to really talk about what is the value of transportation and how can we rethink the different connection points between mobility, between infrastructure, between energy, between development to create a, a better ecosystem from a community perspective and an an access perspective so that, again, not only do people have the option for better transportation decisions, but also the option to go to school where they want, work where they want, take trips whenever they want, to have more of their time back, which I think we all know sitting in traffic takes away from us. And one of the things I've always been excited about around, you know, this autonomous scenario where we're all moving more efficiently and better is more time with my family and also a a safer system, you know, for our two-year-old, for her to never have to drive again and to never have to worry about getting hit by a car in a crosswalk is a pretty inspiring place to be. It's a wonderful place to be because as a parent, you'll still worry as a parent, but you won't worry as much because the roadways will be safer. And if you multiply that scenario with, with you and Mrs. Rodriguez across the board, the world's a happier place and it'll be a good place because of autonomy because autonomy is positive for society. Autonomy is good for society because the future is bright, the future is autonomous, and the future is infrastructure. Greg, thank you so much for coming on the Road to Autonomy Day. Really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks, Gracie, and I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Road to Autonomy podcast. If you've enjoyed listening, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Want to get in touch? Follow us on Twitter at Road to Autonomy or email podcast at B-R-U-L-T-E-C-O.com. The Road to Autonomy is produced by Brulte and Company. The views and opinions expressed on the Road to Autonomy podcast do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of Brulte and Company. The content discussed on this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be taken as legal, tax, investment, or business advice.